disruptions. And whilst the 20th century has persuaded us of our powerful position within a stable world, marking the Anthropocene, in which humanity has begun to exert a geological scale force, the 21st century blatantly declares that the Earth is in flux and that we need to negotiate, not assume, our continued survival. We've therefore begun a worldwide discussion to radically reassess and challenge our established thought processes and practices to respond to these insights. Indeed, to exist in the third millennium is to be caught in a sea of accelerating global change, which has become the new normal. Accordingly, we need to identify approaches that enable us to reach escape velocity from incremental innovation in our perspectives to meet these challenges. We have begun to embrace the idea that the ensuing disruption is not something to be stamped out, but invited into many aspects of our lives, since it presents new opportunities in catalyzing our transition from an industrial to an ecological culture, and offers evolutionary possibilities as the driver of societal forms of punctuated equilibrium. Our shared truths, then, are constantly moving as we interrogate disruption, and the way that we construct and disseminate knowledge is therefore particularly challenging. Indeed, Lee Smolin proposes that the very laws of the universe are not constants, but are in continual evolution. Yet the idea of change is not a new condition but an amplified one. The instability of our world has bubbled beneath the surface of the modern age, and the cause of our global vertigo may arguably be placed at the feet of the internet, which has connected a world that was formerly separated by time, space, and geometric boundaries, and has transformed it instead into a site of simultaneity. Rather than dealing with polarities that establish either or situations such as machine or human, global or local, art or science. Online communications enable us to connect previously paradoxical ideas, relationships and things to open up convergent possibilities that may be expressed as functions of and, and, and to the power of n. Simply speaking, this means that whilst online it doesn't matter whether you're a human or a dog or an educator or a student, what makes a difference is how well connected you are. Indeed, the World Wide Web's great magic is that it connects bodies and destructively transgresses boundaries so that we may view the world anew through different lenses. Yet many challenges and questions arise from convergences that have been accelerated by worldwide communications, travels and industrialization, which have brought about an alteration in the way that we live. They have brought about the consequences in material, not just virtual reality. Of particular concern is that our enhanced lifestyles and blooming industrial connections have also caused planetary scale changes in chemical makeup of the biosphere, so that whilst we've made the most of the advances of the modern age by amplifying the effects of powerful machines in mobilizing natural resources, we are also experiencing material turbulence as a consequence of these rich possibilities. So whilst global telecommunication creates our biggest opportunity for advancement, our greatest challenges arise from the complex material shifts that we are immersed in, which themselves are being altered by our modern lifestyles. These take the form of acidifying oceans, changes in atmospheric chemistry, melting ice caps, rising tides, progressive des desertification, and continent-sized expanses of plastic litter that churn in our seas. The knowledge platforms that we're constructing to deal with these green issues is which, in which this university is making its mark, such as Pat Harvey's research on glycerol as a new biofuel, are also enfolding the ideas of complexity and non-linearity which deal with systems in flux into our solutions. Yet these new knowledge frameworks exist simultaneously with established traditions, such as object-centred hierarchies that are exemplified in machine-based solutions. How we manage disruption 
is not a question of how fast we out the old with the new, but how well we can build upon what we already have achieved by opening up radical new possibilities. In other words, the goal is not to render previous paradigms outmoded, but to recognize their incompleteness through new perspectives. Our pedagogical challenges, therefore, may reside in how we deal with the relationships between methodologies, as well as the acquisition of new data, so that we can open up new spaces for learning, innovating, and contributing to our shared challenges. Indeed, how we work with different knowledge frameworks may be the defining challenge of the 21st century educational practice. Isabel Stainers proposes that convergences between disciplines may be achieved through constructivist approaches, which do not reduce ideas into a deconstruction of their component ontologies. Instead, she proposes that dissimilar specialties may work synergistically, despite their differences, and dream along with each other. Yet these relationships are not built up intermittently through workshops, but are pursued and being integral to research practice, they need to be actively developed, managed and nurtured through shared interests and common goals. This reflection and critical review of where we're at at the beginning of the new millennium, at the theme of today's meeting, is a very crucial part of our understanding of what our educational goals for the coming age may be. 20th century learning, the information on which our current knowledge is based, and the standard against which we are using to approximate new information does not necessarily readily apply to the restless reality of the 21st century. New methods, materials and technologies are emerging, and rapidly, that are beginning to embody these principles. So despite the need for paradigm shifts, the most powerful approaches for implementing change reside in our established systems. So the future of education will be shaped by a hyper-connected reality which will help us design those questions that may help us navigate these challenges in these uncertain times. And whilst institutes of higher education are no longer the keepers of knowledge, they are the bedrock of our knowledge canons and it is likely that in responding to global restructuring of ideas, cultures and technologies, that we will build upon their deep foundations so they may become not redundant, but more complete. Indeed, by embracing disruptive pedagogical technologies, the role of higher education may be transformed, recognises avatars and dialogical communities that help stakeholders such as industry, society, government, build their own tools for discovery in a realm where research and learning are inseparable. Universities will continue to have a critical role to play in establishing forums and methods of the exchange of ideas, for example, in exploring knowledge acquisition, where students are not at the base of a pyramid of order, but are actively constructing network pedagogical processes. For example, Sagata Mitra's TEDx, um, TED Prize winning notion of minimally invasive education through cloud schools, where students self-organize around digital technologies with access to crowd grannies, is now being proposed for schoolless communities in developing countries that enable students to construct peer-reviewed and trans transgenerational knowledge bases. This helps students actively shape their thinking frameworks and rather than being empty vessels in which information is poured, they find ways that are appropriate to their local resources and cultural contexts. Whether bottom-up self-organising knowledge communities of students are enough to generate disruptive practices that address global challenges is yet to be established. Yet it is likely that such forms of practice, when used and combined in and, and, and style, um, with other styles of knowledge transfer, such as the Khan Academy, in, com in combination with traditional universities, may produce radically new ways of learning. Uh, it's all still yet to be seen. Indeed, the future of education may not be just about replacing one successful universal pedagogical system with another, but in identifying ways in which unity of learning, uh, goals, empowerment, opportunity, creation, 
dialogue, advancement may be achieved through a diverse range of approaches that may even hybridise with entertainments such as TED Talks and Z Frank's humorous social media broadcasts. Additionally, these may be articulated through a wide range of knowledge media such as classroom-based learning, field activities, online programmes or workshop shadowing, and not only aimed at the youth, but also at much older generations of students that actively participate to uh, contribute to our global social fabrics, such as Mitra's cloud grannies. And these increasingly uh, increase the openness and connectedness that underpins academic research in shaping the ways that we frame our research questions, develop our outputs, and shape our academic programs. In a complex, constantly changing environment, expectations and opportunities tug at each other, often in different directions. For example, research exercise frameworks and impact assessments require us to explore the unknown whilst specifying dis dis demonstrable societal benefits before the research has actually been conducted. Yet to develop flourishing learning environments that can be applied across many different aspects of global society, local concerns and university life in the face of increasing expectations <coughs> requires us to regularly critique our own practices. At this point, I'd like to talk less generally and share insights gleaned through my TED Fellowship, which offers a navigation framework and case study as an alternative learning system to the university model, which is interwoven with TED.com's online activities, although it's not exclusively delivered through them. And I'd like to just reflect how these relationships may be helpful in thinking about 21st century educational challenges and opportunities, particularly with respect to disruptive learning technologies and how they may relate to the communities that use them. So TED stands for Technology, Entertainment and Design. And whilst education does not specifically feature in its title, it is implicit in its aim, particularly under the leadership of the current director, Chris Anderson. Since 1984, TED had brought together visionaries in technology, science and entertainment as a kind of dating agency between California entrepreneurs and Silicon Valley inventors to share their ideas for a happier, healthier world and make products that would help them do this. For example, a new computer called the Apple Macintosh was demonstrated at the first TED conference. Over the years, a format was established where participants from radically different backgrounds could meet and talk to each other, being unconstrained by traditional knowledge hierarchies. By connecting these groups to the TED platform, a powerful innovation hub was formed, populated by world changers such as Bill Gates, Al Gore, and Nicholas Negroponte. <coughs> In 2006, TED's curator, Chris Anderson, made a decision that would change the impact of the conference when he made videos that had been recorded at the elite conferences freely accessible and online to the general public. Almost overnight, TED.com became an internet sensation. Subjects that mainstream media would have been unlikely to commission, such as neuroscience, economics, climate change, endurance athletics, or particle physics, became ratings phenomena. Take, for example, the charismatic statistician Hans Rosling, who presented a graph in a manner that earned him a standing ovation. Statistics were suddenly cool, as people, it seemed, were not simply content to watch soap operas and houses inhabited by attention-seeking buffoons, but wanted real information. On Tuesday, November the 13th, 2012, TED Talks had been watched by more than one billion people worldwide. Other online broadcast agencies have also benefited from this surge of, in, of online information. The demand for good quality talks wasn't just limited to TED, but TED certainly established there was a market for what might formerly have been considered esoteric, esoteric knowledge by mainstream media, or at least knowledge that previously would have been associated with a university level education. For the first time, anyone with access for a, with a computer could pay, um, that could play simple video could explore new ideas across a whole of different, host of different subjects which were made accessible by clear yet unpatronising talks by international experts and visionaries. Ted's maxims to share ideas worth sharing 
was stimulating inquiring minds and raising ambitions as it invited everyone to think in world-changing terms. In other words, TED invited us to think disruptively. But the potential educational value of TED didn't stop there. TED became part of serious British debates around education in 2010, during the third time that TED Global was held in Oxford, having previously hosted, um, been hosted there in 2005 and 2009. While the TED conference had previously been regarded by the broadsheets as being little more than an exclusive cult for American tree huggers, this time it was critiqued as an alternative knowledge platform to university learning. Here are some of the key educational differences that were commented on by The Guardian and Times. You notice that there's this effectively a, uh, um, a difference between open and closed learning systems here. So Oxford was also another, uh, uh, the start of another experiment, which had been launched um, during the success of TED Africa in Tanzania in 2007. During this event, a hundred new generation entrepreneurs were brought together. They were described as the cheetah generation, as they were fluent in technology and also ran like the wind. This conference profoundly changed the lives of many of its participants and founded a new globalised African community that offered international, social and entrepreneurial support for their ongoing activities. Two years later, in 2009, the African experiment became an integral part of the TED Conference Programme. The TED Fellowship Programme was inaugurated at the annual conference in Long Beach, California, and then was continued in TED Global. It aimed to provide access for creative young thinkers into the entre entrepreneurial community who couldn't otherwise afford to be there. I was admitted to TED's fellowship program in 2009 and became a senior TED fellow in November 2009. I, became, uh, officially, uh, I was officially graduated from the program in, in 2012. The TED fellows are recruited twice a year in cohorts of about 20. One group attends a February TED conference curated by Chris Anderson in um, West Coast America, which has been held at Monterey and Long Beach. Next year it's moving to Vancouver. The other fellows start in July at TED Global, which is a summer conference curated by Bruno Gassani. Um, this is destined to travel to Rio next year, um, and currently um, uh, there are over uh, 300, uh, 309 TED fellows. TED Fellows are recruited from 1,200 to 1,400 applicants for each intake, with a success rate for each applicant at around 2%. You can half this again if you aim to be a senior TED Fellow, and it allows you to continue your internship for two years. Um, just for success rates in comparison, applying to Oxford um, online, I've just uh, uh, had, had a look. Oxford has a success rate of 20%. Cambridge 14%, Yale 7 and Harvard 5.5. So it's highly, highly, highly competitive. Community Director Tom Riley runs the fellowship independently from the TED conference. However, it is connected with, feeds into and is informed by the International TED Conference. At the heart of TED is a talk, a highly accessible, very well produced, <coughs> impact delivery piece that clearly communicates what you're up to. This is not a skill I previously developed or even knew the value of yet. We receive all kinds of coaching, I mean serious coaching, including being supported by the Harnish Foundation with our own speaking coaches. So my coach mentor was Marlene Green, who helped me transform the way that I connected with an audience. Our sessions were very different to academic presentations, which are information focused. Instead, I began to find ways that could help me persuade um, people and, and, and try and encourage them to help me rather than uh, just delivering them um, uh, a, a nice piece of information. So my first talk was not on the main stage, it was in a TED University, which is a small event that takes place before the main conference, where I spoke of my research that proposed to grow an artificial limestone reef underneath the city of Venice using a smart droplet system that I was exploring called protocells. Once this video went online, the visibility of my research rocketed. It even resulted in a program with uh, Red Bull about my work. And now I've had more than one, uh, so one, more than half a million people um, viewing these videos. But the event's not just about the presentations. 
just in the same way that the university is more than just about attending lectures. It's about what happens in the hallways during intermissions and what takes place while socialising in the evening. The TED conference tagline, Ideas Worth Spreading, um, and over the ideas, that's exactly what this um, conference has done. My TED fellowship was where I began to explore what it meant to be part of an open, connected community that could network, that offered unsolicited mutual support, which amplified everyone's work. TED Fellow sponsors not only financially supported the programme, but also became our advisors as to how we might achieve best practice in our own work, or even set up effective businesses. We also went to seminars that helped us understand, for example, how we might get published, turn ideas into products, find new approaches to solving grand challenges, improve our presentation skills, on how, and how or how not to ask for money to fund our projects. Effectively, we were consensually shaping a tailor-made, interactive, connected and relevant curricula with world changes, not just in name, but also in deed. Being a senior fellow helped me extend my time on this programme, being of a similar length to a graduate degree. I was fortunate enough to have three years on the programme rather than two. This enabled me to develop an internationally excellent community of research colleagues and commercial partners. Now, these were not acquired quickly, but through many conversations about shared visions. Although we were taught networking skills and even had developed our elevator pitches, we soon learned that it was best not to hack interesting people, but just to chill and talk about shared interests. In fact, we could trust other TED Fellows to promote our projects, as it's much easier to say just how great another person's work is than to beat drums about your own interests and achievements. Familiar faces and offbeat conversations gradually shape the strengths of our real-world connections, almost as much as the other events we're encouraged to participate in, such as experimental online forums. Oh, and we also bonded by playing together in events such as Cage Fights, an Autodesk special that constituted a theatrical battle of wits. I think on the bottom picture there, I'm taking on um, uh, well, the guy from uh, a car, uh, 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 from Sun. Uh, 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 I'm trying to remember his name at the moment. But, what's that? No, the um, uh, oh, I'll, 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 I'll remember later. But it's essentially, that was that was that was quite a battle of, of the wits. And uh, Jodie Foster was ringing the bell, and Thomas Dolby was uh, um, showing up all the all the placards. But but essentially, you know, the, 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 there were no hierarchies. You know that uh, uh, you know that the the owner of Autodesk standing there in the kilt with his arms raised um, was uh, you know very much uh, part of the of the play as uh, everyone else. Um, but this was actually a really, really important um, uh, experiment. I mean, you know, this uh, cage fight idea was really about, uh, you know, uh, getting to know each other and uh, just mucking in when nobody actually knew what they were doing. So fellows were also participating. You know, we, we also did some serious online stuff. Um, and TED is really trying to make most of its uh, TED.com um, site. Um, and it's being developed at the moment um, into a forum to extend the interactivity of the TED brand. So you notice on the, um, on the graph uh, um, that TED talks are not interactive. There are no questions at the end. Um, so we were designed, asked to design questions to lead conversations. So this is a question I wrote which was about, it was the City 2.0, which was a brand that TED had um, developed. Um, is it evolved rather than made? And it asks questions about how our cities might develop sustainably beyond the current industrial paradigm. And during this, this, this intense exchange of, of, of ideas and comments, which is, you know, kind of branches off um, into uh, you know, multiple strands, it was incredibly challenging, but it did help me refine my research as it was possible to see where I was communicating my ideas well and where I wasn't. And that experience helped me write my first Twitter lecture when I opened the Swedish Twitter University, and yes, it's a real thing. Um, in November it was, um, 2001, it was launched, and the uh, talk I gave was called Beyond Sustainability. It was a very particular way of communicating an idea. It was like a sonnet of 140 characters and 25 lines, each of which was uh, designed to precipitate further um, comment and grow from those 140 characters into you know, egg-branching uh, trees of discussion. Um, now, the, the most successful lectures had curated audiences, which is very much like TED. So you don't just put a Twitter lecture out there. You actually have to make sure that you invite the right people to participate. 
Um, and then those people you know will run with the ideas in ways that will sustain the momentum of the conversation. So this trend lasted for about three months before petering out in February 2012. And it taught me that not all online networks with an educational ambition, or new technologies even, are destined for permanence. Now, TED, came, uh, a TED Fellowship did not just cater for one type of fellow. We were not all entrepreneurs or scientists or music makers, but explorers who bonded through our extraordinary situation being immersed in such a stimulating environment. TED Fellowship lasted beyond the week of the main event and was continually changing a kind of holistic in, uh, education. It included events such as Connect TED, hosted by the Harnish Foundations in New, Le New Orleans, where we benefited through targeting by tutors and experts. I mean, seriously, it was like a, uh, a kind of an eight-hour head-shrinking exercise, uh, which literally tore you um, um, from inside out uh, in terms of you know, uh, what your goals are in terms of your research and, and how you're going to uh, implement it in, a, in, a, in, in any kind of meaningful way. Um, so we, we, we've taken these, uh, these, these, these different kinds of experimental fora um, and uh, uh, you know, continue to, to, to explore and develop experiment, um, even in informal gatherings where we are on our travels. Um, so the mo most popular places that we meet up on our own are London, New York, San Francisco, um, and uh, essentially we, we, we do it at home in environments where we can continue to, con to connect in person and share food, company, and couches. Uh, we tend to leave the cage fighting for Autodesk. Any attempt to describe an intensely and deeply influential three-year experience will be inadequate. By the end of three years of TED, I realised that my new skills were ultimately transferable to a lot of different kinds of situations. For example, in academia with Neil Spiller's avatar group, in industry with Glenn Fiddich, which is where my photo was taken, and also in outreach, as is with the Art Science Prize. However, it may be described, um, my TED fellowship, my TED education, has been an exhilarating experience that just simply changed my life most particularly in the way that I seek to create opportunities for connection as an integral part of my research method. And once you've experienced an interconnected, multidisciplinary, entrepreneurial, highly flexible, exploratory, bold way of working, then it is impossible not to imagine that a 21st century learning environment would benefit from this kind of approach. Indeed, connectivity, multidisciplinarity and convergence are shaping the proficiencies for successful student careers. I think that Sir George Cox most elegantly expresses the skill sets necessary for a thriving 21st century workforce in a quote from the Cox Review of Creativity in Business. He says that we need business people who understand creativity, who know when and how to use a specialist, and who can manage innovation. Creative specialists who understand the environment in which their talents will be used, and who can talk the same language as their clients and business colleagues and engineers and technologists who understand the design process and can talk the language of the business. I am also conscious of my rose-tinted uh, TED spectacles. My good fortune has been to be welcomed into TED's highly connected community and has given me a great deal of privilege that I simply would not have had otherwise uh, any access to. Yet TED itself will be the first to recognise that it has limitations and cannot be all things to all people. Needless to say, not, of, not all of TED activities are viewed positively. The most common criticism being that TED is superficial in its ideas and treatment of its uh, uh, to lead to audiences. Kickstarter, by the way, is a TED Fellow project made by Perry Chen. I'd like to say that there's nothing, uh, absolutely nothing, superficial about giving a TED talk. It requires a huge amount of commitment and a great deal of preparation and editing to distill your entire research career into an abstract that can be understood by non-specialists. But whatever criticisms may be levelled at the delivery of individuals, TED formats are inevitably successful. However, the TED Fellows Programme is not TED, and whilst the conference itself seems to invite rancor, negative reviews about the TED Fellows Programmes or the TED Fellows themselves are much harder to find. In fact, I've, I've actually not found any articles in which the TED Fellowship Programme has been critiqued from an academic or a, a, an educational perspective. Indeed, the only negative account I can find is an online interview by one fellow who willfully left the programme and described the organisation in an online interview as being controlling. 
So while my unfettered enthusiasm might sound like unequivocal proof that I am the successful outcome of a three-year-long brainwashing scheme, my education does raise questions about how TED Fellowship was enhanced by online technologies, especially in maintaining and growing networks. But the most important aspect of my fellowship has been that TED itself takes risks to help us explore possibilities, and it's continuing to experiment. Some experiments work and some dive, some dive terribly. Every TEDster, yes, there is a special name for TED attendees, will have a different opinion on which ones these might be. Yet from my perspective, the TED Fellowship has undoubtedly been one of TED's great successes. Yet how and whether learning experiments such as TED Fellowship or the Khan Academy or Cloud Schools are meaningfully applied and incorporated into traditional educational models is still yet to be revealed. Perhaps they represent the first steps in developing accessible ways of accessing pedagogical instruments that may support worldwide communities in navigating highly dynamic and interconnected networks. Perhaps these online experiences may also equip them with tool sets that enable them to conceptually and practically deal with a constantly changing reality. Some of the parallel sessions today will be presenting new research in these areas and looking more specifically at the role of advanced technological platforms in education such as games, augmented reality and mobile devices. Collectively, these findings may begin to reveal principles of practice that may inform our learning environments as we find ways of making connections between platforms, methods, values and visions so that we can achieve a transition from an industrial-based society towards a fundamentally ecological culture. So I'm extremely excited by the opportunities for convergence, exchange, transformation and development in today's programme. I really look forward to many continued discussions and opportunities to connect and shape our shared futures in education. I'd just like to finish with a quote by David Bone who actually gets his grammar correctly. He says that the ability to perceive or think differently is more important than the knowledge gained. Thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions. So, anybody have any questions for Rachel? Um, uh, research project to critique um, uh, TED's educational values. I mean, at the moment, what's happening is uh, TED is developing TED Ed, which essentially are a series of videos very similar to, to Khan Academy, um, and these are you know, being bundled um, for schools. Um, so they're, they're, they're short, punchy, entertaining videos um, that you know that, 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 that can be curated by, by teachers. Um, and uh, you know these are being made by you know, some of the world's leading academics. And, you know, fantastic animation. Um, but really, in terms of the um, you know the, the fellow, certainly the fellowship has had, as far as I'm aware, absolutely no educational um, critique whatsoever. And I, and I think it would be very valuable, particularly as many of the um, fellows you know, they're, they're not ed university educated. You know, people are coming from uh, Malawi. You know, um, you know, and when we go to Rio, there'll be many more from the, the South Americas. Um, and yet, you know, these these uh, students are not, um, uh, you know, without impact in their communities. You know, they're they're literally, you know, shaping uh, change within their and uh, uh, within their local context. So, for example, um, William Kumbawa, you know, the the, the boy who um, harnessed the wind, you know, changed the the life of his community by creating wind power from an old bicycle wheel. And, uh, found objects, you know, and, and created electricity for the community that then could use to SMS-based texting and uh, mm -hmm. the developed industry. Um, so it, 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 it would be a very, very valuable thing to do, and, and, and it's not been going for very long. I think I, you know, I, I am actually probably one of the longest-serving uh, TED fellows. Um, so um, uh, you know, it's 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 something that TED is um, trying to 
to uh, incorporate, but it's just, just, just doing a lot of things all at the same time. You know, it's, it's developed the TEDx program, which uh, you know, you've probably seen around. There'll be lots of uh, independently organised TED Star events that are themed around you know, local issues or, or local themes. Um, and, and, and that's been a, that's been a huge success. Um, but um, uh, I, 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 think, I think it would be a, a very interesting thing to do, and I'm sure that Chris Anderson would be, would be uh, certainly uh, Bruno would be up for a, for, for a critique. Uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest weakness, of course, is peer review. What do we do with peer review? Um, and uh, TED aren't really interested in peer review, um, and they're, they're quite upfront about that. But that doesn't mean that the, that the, that the system doesn't actually have value um, or, or, or a kind of integrity. No question. Any other questions? I have one question for you, which was really just linking what you talked about with what David talked about, and really the as we see the, the change in university structure, the new ideas coming through, things like MOOCs and so forth. How do you see TED linking into that particular movement? I, I think that TED will always provide a degree of content. Um, I think that the TED X's will probably become more incorporated within university um, events. Um, the, you know, Harvard and Stanford and MIT have taken them on board. You know, like like they you know, like, like they invented them, as it were. Um, so, so I think that the TEDx event is incredibly helpful. I think it's incredibly helpful for students as well in doing presentations. Um, so linking with the tech, linking with the tech, not to, you know, in order to stand up and talk about your project so that your tutors understand you, you know, within three minutes, uh, is, is, is a good st skill to acquire early. Um, and I think that uh, you know, TEDx has helped you do that and give you an opportunity to practice. Um, but in terms of the technology, I, I think that the whole thing is still emerging. I think, I think it's network-based. It's about building those networks. Um, and we don't really mind, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, Second Life or whether it's uh, SMS or whether it's um, uh, uh, Cage Fighting. Um, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, the, the, the network that's, that's making the difference. So I, I guess it's the network aspect that tech will feed into. Okay, well, so no other questions. I'd like to thank Rachel.